Ben here, Jank off today. Not a good day for Anthony Weiner. I got to tell you the news out today that that picture was in fact of Anthony Weiner and I am stunned. <laughs> who didn't know that was Anthony Weiner and who didn't know that he sent it? No one. Nothing had been more obvious in the history of political time. Today, though, Anthony Weiner finally came clean and admitted that, in fact, it was his. Thank you for putting my Chiron up there under Anthony Weiner. That was awesome, Jesus. So Anthony Weiner came clean. Now, my father has contributed a great deal to the American lexicon. He's invented a couple words that are now in the dictionary. But my favorite by far is the word clong, C-L-O-N-G. Might be K-L-O-N-G, I have no idea. And the word clong means a sudden rush of crap to the heart. Think of a clong as you just arrived at Yankee Stadium for game six of the World Series when you realize your tickets are on the kitchen table. That feeling is a clong. You're dressing for dinner at your boss's house. It's an important dinner. And so you ask your wife, hey, does the invitation say 7 or 7.30? And your wife says, oh, it says lunch. That's a clong. Well, today, we can imagine, after his press conference, what type of clong Anthony Weiner had when he realized what was supposed to be a direct message on Twitter instead went to 45,000 followers. Anthony Weiner. Last Friday night, I tweeted a photograph of myself that I intended to send as a direct message as part of a joke to a woman in Seattle. Once I realized I had posted it to Twitter, I panicked. I took it down and said that I had been hacked. Yeah, I'll bet you panicked. <laughs> oh, no! That is the new definition of a clown. When you think you're sending a pretty girl a picture of your penis, and it turns out you're a congressman and you sent it to 45,000 strangers. That's a clong. Weiner went on to explain why he told the lie in the first place and kept it going for nine days. I then continued with that story to stick to that story, which was a hugely regrettable mistake. This woman was unwittingly dragged into this and bears absolutely no responsibility. I am so sorry to have disrupted her life in this way. To be clear, the picture was of me, and I sent it. Yeah, we got that. I got to be honest, we knew that 10 days ago. <laughs> you see, there was no other explanation. I thought in the beginning that it would have made sense for Anthony Weiner to say, hey, look, man, the picture was of me, and if he was going to continue with the lie that he was hacked, and I thought that was a possibility, but obviously the picture was of him. You say, hey, somebody got into my computer. I got a lot of pictures on my computer that are meant to be personal, I think we all have some of these pictures. I'm incredibly embarrassed that it got out, but he should stop pretending that saying it was the picture of you and, say, and his answer of, there are pictures. <laughs> That's literally, it's the worst answer anyone's ever given. There are pictures. Yeah, there are pictures of you and your underwear. The problem also wasn't that Anthony Weiner sent a picture of himself in his underwear. I think people are missing this. The problem is not that he was in his underwear. The problem is that he wasn't wearing pants over his underwear. And I think it's an important distinction for us to make. All right, you know, so... Can we... Can we be fair? Yeah, a little let's, bit. Let's be fair. I mean, maybe it's not strictly you, because, you know, you do the Happy Hour Friday show. <laughs> Did we really think that that was him, or that he wasn't... Because the, the, the words like doctor may not be... All that stuff oh, is thrown no, no. out there, and I feel like a lot of people ate it up. Uh, no, no, in, support, I, I was, in support of him. No, I was positive it was him. I think I was pretty clear on Friday that I, I thought it was him and he should just admit that, that the picture was in his computer and that I'm sorry it got out and it was personal and it was embarrassing. I did buy the hacked part. I did not, I, I believed it. You, when he answered the, the question, there are pictures out there, that meant that, that <laughs> there are pictures, that meant it was him. Uh, but I did believe that maybe somebody had gotten into his computer yeah, because and sent it out. The, the uh, Andrew Breitbart factor really put it over the top. Yeah. when it made all, you think that. Yeah, right, because Andrew Breitbart then, after Wiener gave his press conference today, Breitbart gets up there and says everything we've reported in this scandal is true. And uh, you don't want to go, hey, way to go, Andrew Breitbart. You're now one for seven. 
you just sort of sawed off an inside fastball and dunked it into right field for your first hit of the season. You struck out six straight times to open the season. You're the worst player in the league. You're a giant liar, but you dropped a single in front of the right fielder. Bravo. You still need to be outright at a double A. So uh, Wiener eventually, and now this will get to the extent of his line, we'll get to whether he should stay in Congress, whether he can survive this. He says he's not resigning. Uh, he continued with his press conference, and he then uh, got very emotional. I'm deeply sorry for the pain this has caused my wife, Huma, and our family, and my constituents, my friends, supporters, and staff. In addition, over the past few years, I have engaged in several inappropriate conversations conducted over Twitter, Facebook, email, and occasionally on the phone with women I have met online. I have exchanged messages and photos of an explicit nature with about six women over the last three years. For the most part, these, these communications took place before my marriage, though some have sadly took place after. To be clear, I have never met any of these women or had physical relationships at any time. I haven't told the truth. And I've done things I deeply regret. I brought pain to people I care about the most and the people who believed in me. And for that, I'm deeply sorry. I apologize to my wife and our families as well as to our friends and supporters. I am deeply ashamed of my terrible judgment and actions. So it was interesting when Andrew Breitbart then followed him up on stage and took credit. Andrew Breitbart said he has a, another revealing photo of Anthony Weiner, Weiner. So the, this is not over. Uh, and Weiner says he's not resigning. The issue can be then, as, as we see other pictures, as we'll probably hear from other women, uh, there already was another woman today, a 26-year-old woman who says she's had a relationship online with him. Everything appears that it's, at this point, consensual. Uh, these are grown women. Uh, this seems to be a lesser scandal than some others, but it's still a significant scandal. Unlike the Republicans, Anthony Weiner does not have the hypocrisy angle to deal with. So the question is, can he survive? Uh, much of that rests with, I think, how the House Democrats deal with him. Uh, Nancy Pelosi today said she was deeply disappointed uh, in him and called for a, uh, a ethics investigation. Uh, that seems to me a, a fairly normal course of action. If that's a sign that they're going to push him aside, then I don't think he can survive. Uh, if that's just the normal course of events, then he probably can. But his days, at least temporarily, as a sort of a champion of the left and an attack dog uh, of the right and uh, being sort of appropriately critical of the Obama administration when necessary and when called for, those days are gone, at least for now. Uh, I hope he survives the scandal. Uh, his behavior shows a grave lack of judgment. Uh, I, I certainly understand uh, that lack of judgment. Uh, I'm sympathetic to it, but it does show it. There's no denying that. And uh, I don't know whether he can survive it. A lot, much of it depends on the Democrats, less so on the Republicans. At a time when, uh, uh, when the Democrats win that seat in the 26th district of New York, ironically, because Chris Lee has to resign with their focus on Medicare and the retreat that the Republicans are on. The Republicans are on the defensive because of this. The problem some Democrats may feel there with Anthony Weiner is the last thing we want to do is be distracted at this moment when we have the Republicans retreating and maybe you should just go and if they put a lot of pressure on him, who knows what he'll do. In a world where that doesn't exist, I think he could probably survive this if there is nothing else because he has to be able to say that everything that he said today was it. Standard PR advice, the only good PR device at the moment you come clean has got to be that you have come clean about everything. He can't have met any of these women, and he can't have, basically, he can't have lied about anything at this point. But this is not going away because there's going to be, uh, we're going to see some more pictures, and there's going to be an examination of whether he used office funds to conduct these illicit online romances and whether he used taxpayer dollars to cover it up, all of these things. So the story's not going away. Uh, I think he can survive it, but I think it'll be very difficult. 
I hope he does survive it. Sarah Palin. Uh, <laughs> Sarah Palin and American history. I don't care that Sarah Palin doesn't know anything about American history. Uh, in fact, I love that she doesn't know anything about American history. But what I love more uh, about Sarah Palin not knowing anything about American history is the zeal with which Sarah Palin defends her lack of knowledge about American history. Because it's very clear that Sarah Palin took, ever since she made the first mistake about Paul Revere, has taken a significant crash course in American history, and she still doesn't get it. All she needed to do was answer a one-minute question, and she still can't do it. I remember back in after 08, and uh, sitting here at this table, I think we had this table, maybe it was the old table, with Michael Shore and Jenk Uger talking about Sarah Palin's political future, and Michael and Jenk telling me that she was done, she had no future, and I was insisting that's crazy talk, don't count her out. I still maintain that. But uh, I think I still was very wrong about one thing, is I thought the way that Sarah Palin would survive was if she took things seriously and she sort of hit the books because she's incredibly charming, she's attractive, and she's very likable. And I'm not talking to the people who hate her. I'm saying that abstractly, she's likable, she's pleasant. The hockey mom thing, we can make fun of it, but it's real. And if she sort of boned up, uh, then who knows? But here's the thing, I don't think she can bone up because here she clearly did bone up and she sounds like a moron. So anyway, in case you forgot, here's her first answer. Uh, it's a Boston local news, a Fox News affiliate in Boston covering her first attempt to answer the Paul Revere question. So uh, this would be our clip uh, number four, uh, Sarah Palin back, uh, I think over the weekend, trying to answer the question uh, about Paul Revere when she's at the Old North Church there in Boston. It appears Sarah Palin may need to brush up on her American history. She visited the Old North Church today here in Boston, the focal point of Paul Revere's historic ride, but it sounds like she got a bit confused on the details. He who warned uh, the, the British that they weren't going to be taking away our arms uh, by ringing those bells and, and um, making sure as he's riding his horse through town to send those warning shots and bells that uh, we were going to be secure and we were going to be free. Okay, whatever. All right, so we know she gets that wrong. Okay, so then she goes on Fox News Sunday and Chris Wallace says, okay, look, you know you blew that story and gives her a chance to right the ship. And Sarah Palin steers the ship into an iceberg. You realize that you messed up about Paul Revere, don't you? You know what? I didn't mess up about Paul Revere. Here's what Paul Revere did. He warned the Americans that the British were coming, the British were coming, and they were going to try to take our arms, so we got to make sure that uh, we were protecting ourselves and, and um, uh, shoring up all of our ammunitions and, and our firearms so that they couldn't take it. But remember that the British had already been there, many soldiers, for seven years in that area. And part of Paul Revere's ride, and it wasn't just one ride, he was a courier, he was a messenger. Part of his ride was to warn the British that were already there that, hey, you're not going to succeed, you're not going to take... American arms. You are not going to beat our own well-armed uh, person's uh, individual private militia that we have. He did warn the British. And in a shout out, gotcha type of question that was asked of me, I answered candidly and I know my American history. Ah, gotcha's back. A gotcha type of question. So she had her talking points. She's like, uh, uh, the British, British have been there a number of years. Some of them have been there seven years. So she got that from uh, whoever taught her some history uh, lessons over the past 36 hours. And then Paul Revere, he made a number of rides. She was like, he hadn't just, a, it wasn't just one ride. Uh, and he was a courier, he was a messenger. All this stuff she obviously just learned. And then when she remembered one of the talking points, I do this all the time when I like learn stuff for the show and then uh, and I need to regurgitate it quickly before I forget it again. It happens all the time or when I, I go on stage with some information. Like when you remember it, you get excited and your voice gets higher when you remember it. Some of the British had been there as long as five to seven years. Like, come on, man. She got, and she can't even get it out in any order. Her sentence structure doesn't make any sense. She's putting like our, uh, verbs before articles. She was thinking, you know, made you ride bells ring. Hey, history, me, no, it. Well, American. So anyway, it's ridiculous in case the, I, Paul Revere, man, like you don't have to be, like I was an American history major, I, I don't know a lot about American history. 
I've forgotten more than I know. I'm not a Paul Revere expert. I don't know exactly what he was doing, but I don't really pretend to. And by the way, if I'd been at the Old North Church, I don't know, I'd read a couple things. I, I know basically that what he was doing was warning the, he was warning future Americans. He was warning the rebels, okay? That's what the British are coming, the British are coming means. And when Paul Revere wrote about it later, what he had done in his effort to basically warn like Sam Adams and John Hancock was that in his ride, he was trying not to be detected by the British. That was the point of the ride. He wasn't shooting guns and ringing bells. I mean, and I don't know a lot more than that, except now what I've learned in the last couple of days, which I did not know, was that the only reason the British were ever notified that we were there and that he rallied people to warn us about them, them being the British and a loyal American settlers, loyalists, not settlers, Americans here, loyal to the British. Everybody was British back then, by the way. There was no country yet. Um, was because he eventually during his ride got captured and at gunpoint said, hey, by the way, I warned everybody. So get ready, we're coming. Ben, anyway. What's the matter with you? Don't you realize Americans have been badass since before we were Americans? That's right. He went to every British soldier and he said, you know what? You know what you're not gonna do? You're not taking my motherfucking gun. <laughs> what? And he walked away with his hands back. It's like, do, do something. <laughs> he was like, uh, he was like uh, LeBron or Dwayne Wade after they hit a big three. Shot clock winding down. He was like this. You're not taking my gun. And the British were like, what does this mean? What are you doing? <laughs> All right, so anyway, she doesn't know what she's talking about, but what else is new? I don't think it makes any difference. We got a couple other great things about Sarah Palin. Hey, Sus, you got that picture? So uh, this was in the New York Times yesterday. It was Sarah Palin. She was at, uh, I don't know, her whistle stop tour or whatever the hell she's doing. And she's on a motorcycle. Man, she, she's cute. I'm sorry, she looks good. Am I wrong? Doesn't she look good? Boys? Yeah. Hey, Seuss, she looks good, right? Yeah. JR? I'll go along with it. Yeah, yeah sure. see, and you're a, hard, you're a much harder sell than Hey, Seuss. I'm trying not to. because I know, but she looks good. She looks good on the bike. That's all there is to it. That's why you can't count her out. Howard Dean says you can't count her out. Of course, what Howard Dean was saying, if she wins the nomination, she could win, which isn't really saying much. Of course she can win the nomination. Of course she can win the general election if she wins the nomination. Okay, so the great thing is, is that even uh, the, uh, Sarah Palin's biggest cheerleaders, the boys at Fox News, um, they, <laughs> they, they, it turns out they can make any mistake. Although, as we know, Roger Ailes may hate Sarah Palin, so maybe this was intentional because we don't believe anything that, Sarah pa that uh, Fox News does, like when they did a story on Sh uh, Shirley Sherrod and ran a picture of Maxine Waters. Or was it a story on Maxine Waters and ran a story of Shirley Sherrod? I can't, either way, they got it wrong. They thought, well, I don't know, they're black women. Who cares? Nobody will know the difference. That's Fox News' philosophy regarding black women. So anyway, here they run this little story. Here's a Fox News blonde girl. I don't know her name. They're all the same. Look at me, confusing hot blonde women. Am I any better? Am I any better? So here's Fox News running a story on, uh, on Sarah Palin uh, this weekend. Meanwhile, it's all eyes on Sarah Palin in an exclusive interview with Fox News. The former VP candidate says she's still 50-50 about a 2012 run, and if she does, Howard Dean has a warning for Democrats. He says Palin could beat President Obama. Okay, so anyway, nothing wrong with that story. It's just a straight-out story. It was from the end of last week where Dean said that uh, Palin could, in fact, win, as we referred to. And we saw that picture there that they ran uh, on the uh, over-the-shoulder graphic of uh, Sarah Palin, and she looked pretty good in that picture. Do we have another shot of that picture? Yeah. That's the picture they ran. <laughs> that Tina Fey. <laughs> so, I don't know. It's like, uh, and then, you know, at first I thought, wow, Fox News could screw anybody up. But then I remembered, just as I was talking about Roger Ailes hating Sarah Palin. So, I don't know. Maybe uh, Fox News uh, has it. In. It was on Greta Van Susteren's show that they made that uh, mistake. And Greta gave that good apology when they made that uh, Shirley Sherrod uh, Maxine mistake. I liked Greta's apology. It was a good one. She was clearly genuinely embarrassed. All right. Uh, anyway, coming up next, uh, stick around. Uh, we're going to hear from uh, Rick Santorum, by the way, about America's greatness. So Rick Santorum is a tool. <laughs> God damn, it's good stuff. Um, uh, 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 Rob Zerbin's on the show. Rob Zerbin uh, running against Paul Ryan for Congress in Wisconsin. It's an interview you don't want to miss. We got a lot of other good stuff. Uh, uh, coming up to uh, in the program. Haley Barber, Rick Santorum, we're going to get to all that good stuff 
uh, when we come back. Uh, but Rob uh, Zerbin, coming up in the show. Welcome back to TYT. Anna and Ben with you, the banana show. <laughs> I, I know Ben loves it every time I call it that. I think it's awesome. Yeah, I yeah. like it yeah, personally. Good. Uh, all right. A new uh, Newsweek and Daily Beast poll shows that Americans are extremely angry, and they're mm. angry about a number of different things, Very right? Very pissed. Um, they were basically asked about their economic situation, their financial situation, um, their sex drive, their sex lives, their relationships. And it, it seems like more and more Americans are dissatisfied with their life um, or with their lives. Uh, for instance, three-fourths say that the country is on the wrong track, mm -hmm. okay, which I think a lot of people can agree with. Um, when, when was that number, like, way lower in recent memory? I in mean, recent memory, yeah. I mean, when, no. when, when was do you remember a time when it was like 19 percent of Americans say we're on the wrong track, 80 percent think we're headed in the right track. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I can't remember since the. I mean, I'm extremely young, so um, you know, in recent memory, I yeah. can't remember a time. But what about you? Like, I mean, I don't know. I don't remember these polls. I'm sure that mm -hmm. there was a time. I'm sure in the 80s we were feeling good, and probably sometime in the 90s, but not since Bush took over. I feel like during the Clinton administration, people were happier. Yeah. You know, they were I experiencing economic prosperity and everything was great, yeah. and then uh, since Bush came in. I think people interpret that question politically a lot, too, is that the political infighting leads people to think that, too. Mm -hmm. And that, first of all, half the people automatically who are not in power are going to say that we're on the wrong track. Mm -hmm. You know, unless you have a president that sort of just wild, widely appeals across, you know, universally. I, I'm sure Reagan, early years of Reagan, post him getting shot, it was probably very high. And our political parties are so polarized at this point. That's that what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, yeah you're totally right about that. Um, also, according to the poll, two-thirds are mad at God. Mm, wow. That, that's an interesting statistic right yeah, there. That two-thirds, that's an overwhelming number. Yeah, it seems unfair. What did she do? <laughs> 81% say uh, that they did not feel that the Obama administration was doing enough to deliver jobs to Americans. 50% yeah. think the president has no real plan to close the budget. 30% mm -hmm. uh, say that their financial issues yeah. make them angry, not yeah. just upset, angry. Yeah, it's not a good number for Obama. 50% say they think the president has no real plans. 40% say he does. Um, Republicans, though, uh, they, what is this, 58% saying that... Uh, uh, that the Republicans are just blaming Obama uh, rather than making their own proposals 58 to 29. So the numbers aren't good for either one. Sorry, what was the next number you gave? And then the last one, which I found fascinating, and it amazes me that no one in Congress listens to it, 68% say that they want to raise the taxes on the wealthy. Yeah. Um, right, of course, but nah, the Democrats not hearing that. <laughs> They're just going to ignore it. Yeah. When that number hits 90, Do you think then, that then they'll think, okay, it's a political winner. 81, nah, not enough. Not enough. Is that right? What was it, 81? Uh, or 68? 68. 68%. Oh, well, when, maybe when it hits 80. Maybe when it hits 80. Two thirds of the country? Eh, not enough. Not enough. I know. And it's not enough Freaking. to now have a, an organization of wealthy people, the top 1% of the country, who also want the Obama administration to raise taxes 68, on the wealthy. 68, 27 is that number. Unbelievable. To raise taxes on the wealthy. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think so. All right. The Daily Beast wrote this really fascinating article um, about Dominique Strauss-Kahn and how men, especially businessmen that are traveling, expect sex while they're traveling, right? And I think the headline to this article is a little misleading because they're saying... <laughs> you think it's misleading? Okay, let me read you the headline yeah. to this story because it's extremely misleading. It says, many married men expect sex along with their room service, according to a Newsweek poll. Yeah, it's not misleading. That's what I expect. Yeah, according to the poll. By the way, room service almost invariably brought by a guy. You think so? Yeah, I get a lot of room service. Mm -hmm. It's almost always brought by a guy. What do you mean brought by a guy? Like s called up by a guy? No, the guy who brings you your room service, the guy who brings the burger. Why is that, though? I noticed that, too. Why is that? How come it's never a female? Like, what, the females just wash, you know, wash the sheets and yeah. change your bed, empty the garbage? That's right. Meaning I'll work. Women's work. No, I don't know why. It just seems like it. I'm sure that, uh, I mean, there have been, but I just like it where, where I stay in Atlanta, that mm -hmm. generally it seems to be a guy. 
most You're right of the about time. that. And I, I really don't have an issue with that. I was just <laughs> yeah. making fun. So, I mean, but, but I, many men expect sex along with their room service. First of all, you just ordered the food. It's hot. Why do you want to have sex? <laughs> like, I mean, it just, I, I, like, seriously, I got a cheeseburger. Like, back off. <laughs> Get away from my penis. Please. I got to eat. Yep. Yeah, I'm just saying. <laughs> So um, what they did for this poll is they uh, interviewed 400 married men, and they found out that 21% of them admit to wanting uh, to cheat on their spouses while they're traveling. Who does this poll? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, honey, I'm going to be late for work. I'm doing a poll <laughs> on, <laughs> on how I like to get laid when I travel. <laughs> I'll be home later. Just order room service. I mean, what, what kind of nonsense is this? How do they find these guys? I don't know. That's, that's a really good question because as I was reading about this poll, I'm thinking, how do they find the respondents? How do they know the respondents are being 100% honest? Because I'm thinking if out of the 400 people, 21% admit that they want to have sex when they cheat, this is all self-reporting, right? Imagine how many more men would well, want to cheat, but they just don't want to admit it for the poll. Well, but here's the thing. I, I, that, that would be my initial response, too. But then let's think it through even more. Because, mm -hmm. obviously, you, you know what the poll is, right? So if you really don't, if you're really not comfortable being honest, you, you're probably just not going to do the poll. Mm -hmm. So I think that if you're doing the poll, you kind of want to be honest about it. So it might be, if anything, to me it might even be higher. Because if you're doing the poll, you've got to be completely confident with the, with the anonymity of the poll. Mm -hmm. So it's probably about right. My instinct was to say the same thing. And, and if you cornered people and forced them to take it, then unquestionably. But, I mean, if, you're, if you find these guys who want to do it, hey, we want to do a poll about, like, when you're traveling, how much you want to get laid when you're traveling. You're like, oh, yeah, sure, I'll stop what I'm doing to mm -hmm. that poll. Fantastic. <laughs> um, so it's 21% want to cheat, 8% have actually done it. Mm -hmm. and 6% have paid for it. Right, and then when it comes to hotel workers, 2% of the businessmen have had sex with hotel workers. Right, now we were talking about that. That probably, to me, doesn't mean the, the, the maids, the, mm -hmm. cleaning, the cleaning staff. Hotel worker, I mean, it could be anyone. Right, because there's no time uh, for the, you, I mean, like that's, you know, it's probably like, like the people at the bars. Mm -hmm. like waitresses or bartenders. Someone that you have an opportunity to sit down with yeah. and have an actual and, conversation. And, and you're drinking. I mean, you, there, it's the art of seduction. Although, like, let me just say, uh, later on... How are you, you going to seduce the maid? <laughs> that's what I was going to get to in a second. Nice tell. So there's actually a really serious aspect to the story, okay? I'm going to be mm -hmm. a little bit of a Debbie Downer. But um, it turns out mm -hmm. that... Mm -hmm. <laughs> it turns out that for this poll, they interviewed several hotel managers, especially in, in the New York area. And... Some of the interviews were telling, like for instance, some of the hotel managers um, say that they will have an extremely wealthy businessman staying in the presidential suite. And since that guy is staying in that presidential suite and he's dropping so much money, he will expect women to flock to his room, right? So some of the hotel workers will feel like it's their obligation to have women for that man. Okay, um, another uh, maid who worked for one of these New York hotels said that she walked into a presidential suite and the businessman was just laying in bed naked and asked her to, you know, fondle his genitals. Can you say that again without laughing? No. So, so he's lying naked. I'm on just the picturing it in my head. I mean, it's not, it's not a laughing matter. Don't get me wrong, but I'm just, I, I can't no, believe I the audacity to, of this guy to be to laying in bed naked and say, Hey, can you rub my genitals for me? Just say fondle my genitals without laughing. No, I can't. Just try it. Just one time. <clears throat> Go ahead. Three, I can't. You're two, staring. one. Fondle my genitals. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Ha, the, the again the uh, the unbel like really like I know. Hey, how are you? She wanted. <laughs> She, he asked, he called up, asked for a blanket, right? Mm -hmm. In the story. Right. And then she gets in there and he's like, yeah, could you just come follow my genitals, if you don't mind? And she's like, yeah, no. <laughs> no, I'm not going to fondle your freaking genitals, freak. And then, but then she goes to complain. I know, but the, the thing is, for us, it's absurd. We would never in a million years think to do something like that. But I think it's that sense of entitlement that yeah. these extremely wealthy men have. They think, yeah, so I'm naked on a bed and I'm asking the maid to fondle my genitals. Why is that a big deal? And then she goes to complain, and nobody does anything. And they no one does anything. And they're like, "Ha ha, it's funny. Welcome to the club. This is what happened. That's crazy. It's ludicrous. I don't." Um, but I, I get, like, you might with a concierge or somebody who you strike up a relationship with, 
because hotels, you know, especially the nicer hotels, they're so involved in customer service, you could form a relationship. But you know, I mean, the, the housekeeping staff, like, I mean, why the, this guy, Dominique Strauss-Kahn, and we don't know that he did it, but assuming that he did it, I mean, there's no seduction here. He, if it's true, what well, the allegations are, I mean, he attacked her, he raped this woman. Mm -hmm. Like, that's not, there's no like, hey, I tried to have sex with the maid. There's no, he didn't try to have sex with her. He assaulted, assaulted her, her violently, her. yeah. Right. Um, I don't think it gets me. It's like, uh, like when you, you read about like rock bands and the groupies, and you read about some of these bands. I was just listening to like ACDC, a guy on uh, Howard Stern, and the the sex these guys had before AIDS is unbelievable, mm -hmm. right? But these women are attracted to the guy's talent, really. Like that's what gets it. I mean, they're rock stars, and they're caught up in the fame and the talent. Like I get that. That would make me a little uncomfortable if I were a rock star mm -hmm. that women wanted to sleep with me because of my fame. But also I would be like, no, they dig me because I'm really good at something mm -hmm. and that's sexy. And I would probably live with that. But the idea that I was on the presidential suite and was really wealthy and just that I thought because I was really rich and spending a lot of money that women should therefore do things for me, I couldn't, that would anti turn me on. Like I, I, don't, I don't want that. I wouldn't, that would not interest me in any way. Like how does that, I don't, I get fetishes. We all have fetishes. I don't. I don't understand why that would turn somebody on. That seems yeah, just I don't even creepy. Think, I don't even think it's a fetish. I think that No, I just mean I'm willing to understand different sexual desires of people. Oh, you're, but I, okay, I see what you But that saying. one's like, who wants, like I'm rich, so I, anytime, I mean, I'm lot not rich, but on the maybe one or two occasions that it occurred to me at a certain point, I'm like, is this girl hanging out with me because she thinks like I have some money? Mm -hmm. It's like all I want to do is go away instantly. It grosses me out. Well, the, the, and I, I think mean, I was wrong, but it grosses me out. No, and there's a difference between having a semi relationship with a girl and just sleeping with her. I think that these guys are able to live with themselves and they're able to get turned on by this because they just sleep with these girls and that's it. You know? He asked me to fondle his genitals. <laughs> Bring me a blanket and uh, when you're here, fondle my genitals. <laughs> Unbelievable. All right, 800 women in Malaysia have created a group known as the Obedience Wi Obedient Wives Club. And um, many women in Malaysia are against this because they feel that they have finally progressed in society and they're able to hold good jobs and they're able to be seen as equals in Malaysia. But then the Obedient Wives Club comes in and, you know, it's like an Islamic group. They come in and they basically say, no, 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 forget about working, forget about everything. All you need to do is have sex with your husband whenever he wants it. Make sure you have a smile on your face when it happens and just shut up and take it. Now, of course, people are, are upset about this because there are still these little pockets of very conservative um, women in uh, Malaysia, right? And the women in Malaysia want to progress to the point where that doesn't exist anymore. And they're worried that this is going to snowball and multiply into something bigger, which I don't really think is going to happen. It's a small group of 800 women who are saying ridiculous things. If they want to be obedient and if they want to do nothing with their lives other than sleep with their husbands and make their husbands happy, then I say let them do it. It's their lives, it's what they want to do. They say disobedient wives are the cause for upheaval in the world. I don't think that's really the problem. I mean, if I were to rank the things that were the cause of upheaval in the world, that would, that was, that's probably 12th. Yeah, not even 12th. Yeah, we had 14th. It's definitely in the top 20. Um, oh, this is nonsense. But, you know, it's funny because there's so much, like, if you framed this differently, mm -hmm. if this were like a women's empowerment group that was all about, yeah, like, you know, be bold, be strong, and, you know, if you, if you want to be a whore to your husband, do it. Be strong. Embrace your sexuality. I like, think you should be a whore to your husband. Right. That's funny. I do. That's interesting because, no. like, this quote is so almost perfect. This woman says, uh, this is uh, one of the women in the club, the founder, one of the founders. Sex is a taboo in Asian society. Like, so she wants to reverse that. And you're like, good, right? Mm -hmm. So it starts strong. We have ignored it in our marriages, but it's all down to sex. And you're like, good, this is it. Let's, all right, she's two for two. We're rolling along. A good wife is a good sex worker to her husband. Ah. <laughs> and then you go. A good sex worker. Why? Sex worker Why to her husband. Why did you put worker in? Why do you? And then she goes, what is wrong with being a whore to your husband? And like, even then. If that had been the third sentence, yeah. after, you know, what's wrong with being a whore? And then she's like, because it's like dot, dot, dot to your husband. Like, and then, like, you're 
a worker, but to your husband, you're awesome. That's in your privacy, your home, and great. Woo. Oh, a good wife is a good sex worker. No, no, no. A good wife is not a good sex worker to her husband. <laughs> A, a, good, a good wife, no one is a sex worker to anyone. It's never good to be a sex worker. That's a bad job, sex working. It's yeah. horrible. And look, stories like this used to really upset me, and they'd make me really angry. And there's, there, this isn't just happening in Malaysia. There's a group of Christians in the United States that also believe the same way. They believe that women are useless to society. The only thing that they're good for is supporting their husbands, having sex with their husbands, cooking for their husbands, cleaning for their husbands, you get the picture, right? And it would make me think, no, 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 but we finally progressed to a point in society where we're supposed to be seen as equals. Why would you want to step back? But then I realized, you know what? It's your prerogative. You do what you want to do. If you want to be at home and you want to be, you know, your husband's playmate and that's it, then that's what you want to do. That's your life, you know? It's a little upsetting because I feel like these women have been brainwashed into thinking this way. That's the problem. That, yeah. That's the problem is the societal pressure and the, the lack of opportunity because it, it's part of a lack of opportunity. If, 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 if Here, if someone is making a cognitive choice to do that, um, and it's why maybe, I don't know how you feel, but curious to find out, why women who of sound mind make a choice to work in the sex industry, women mm -hmm. who make a choice here to, uh, who empowered women, and there will be some who say there's no such thing, to work in the sex industry, or like in porn. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're, they're grown-ups, they're making a choice. You may think the industry exploits women, but these are, it's hard to say these, it exploits women and then get on the women who make the choice. Here, in, in a country where you might be forced into it, it's a whole different argument. Yeah, I agree with you on that. Um, so anyway, I don't know, and I know there are some women who would disagree strongly with that, and I, I respect that, and I'm certainly, I, I respect it. All right, let's take a break. When we come back, um, people get arrested for feeding the homeless. All right, incredible story that I find unbelievable. We'll be back with that and more.